Hi everyone, we recently passed 200,000 subscribers on the SUV RVing channel, and not too long ago we also passed 500 videos posted to the channel. So to celebrate, I'm going to answer a bunch of your questions regarding a variety of topics. I have like 120 or 130 questions in my phone that I'm going to answer. You don't have to watch the whole thing, this is going to be a long video. I'm going to break it up into sections by category, like the theme of the question. And so there will be chapter markers in the YouTube video, and I will also put on the screen here the different uh, the timestamps for the different parts of this video. I haven't done a Q&A video in about five and a half or six years, I think, so I figured it was time. And I asked you guys on YouTube and Instagram to give me the questions, so that's where these are coming from. I apologize if I butcher your name as I read your question. And I have changed a lot of the questions slightly just to make them a little bit more concise. And so I'm going to go through and answer these questions as I hike this little trail that I do near my house. So the first category is safety and encounters. And this question comes from 18 Anderson K. Do you get scared awful people will hurt you when SUVing in remote places? My biggest fear. No, I don't. You know, it's, it's not dangerous. <laughs> I've never had any problems out on the road. I think that if you are afraid of people, then don't camp near people. Just go down a dirt road and keep going until there are no more people. I've had zero bad experiences with people when I'm camping on the road. And I would be 100% fine with my wife camping in any of the places that I've camped on this channel, which has got to be like, I don't know, hundreds and hundreds of campsites at this point. Next question from Kevin Kruger, 9171. Have you had any negative confrontations with locals, law enforcement, other boondockers, etc., despite camping legally and respectfully? No, I haven't. Sorry to disappoint you guys. I know you're looking for like juicy stories, but I don't have any. JNC Wander Out asked, have you ever felt in danger at a campsite? Um, really the only time is when, um, like I remember a time specifically when I was in California, kind of near Lake Tahoe, camped, and there was a wildfire in the area, and I didn't know where the fire was or where it was going, but I could smell it really strongly, like it really smelled like wildfire. And I was concerned that like, during the night, the fire would come and, and, you know, burn me. Uh, luckily it did not happen, obviously, but that's really the only time I've been been worried at a campsite. I think I've probably been worried other times when like, you know, when thinking about weather related stuff, like if I get snowed on in the middle of the night or like if I'm camped on, on the far side of a creek and it rains overnight and that could, could raise and, and kind of cut me off from getting back out of there. But apart from that, no. John C. Brzezinski asked, do you ever run across potential predators? Along with that, do you carry protection like bear spray or a firearm? I see bears every, probably at least once a year on average. I don't think I saw any last year, uh, but then the year before I saw one, the year before that I saw probably three or four. So it just, just depends, just varies. Never had any problems with bears. I do carry bear spray when I'm in grizzly bear country. So a lot of places in uh, here in Western Wyoming or in Montana, uh, even some spots in Eastern Idaho, I will carry bear spray then. If it's just black bears, then, then no, I won't carry bear spray. And as far as other predators go, I've seen one mountain lion, and that's about it. Uh, I've seen, I see moose all the time, and those are kind of dangerous if you get too close to them. I see mountain goats occasionally when I'm up high on a mountain peak, and those guys can, uh, can hurt you too. But other than that, nope, nothing too bad. Have you ever had a Sasquatch encounter? No, I haven't. Scariest thing to ever happen during your travels? Again, you know, nothing too crazy. Probably uh, driving in the mountains in heavy snowstorms is the scaredest that I, I get. And that happens, you know, a few times a year, uh, a few times a season, and uh, it's just, I think that's like the, the real dangerous part of, of what I do. Sometimes I just kind of have to get somewhere, or I really want to get somewhere, and I have to go up and over a snowy mountain range to do it. And, you know, sometimes I'm going 25 or 30 miles an hour on those mountain roads, and it's, it's, a white out and my I'm white knuckling the, the steering wheel. Not great. Debbie Lermund 1553 said, Tristan, I'm sure you're aware of the pitfalls of hiking and or climbing alone, but I often wonder while watching your adventures how you navigate some of the trickier rock climbs without a spotter. Uh, so spotter can mean a couple different things. I'm not sure exactly what you mean. Like in rock climbing and bouldering specifically when you're just like climbing boulders and you have a pad, like a, a foam pad underneath you, 
you have a spotter who like will kind of direct you onto the pad. I don't know if you mean that or just like a spotter to like tell me where to go as I'm climbing the cliff. Uh, either way, I don't really, I don't really need that. The stuff that I climb isn't, isn't difficult enough for me to, uh, A, for me to fear falling, in which case I would need the, the first kind of spotter, and B, it's not difficult enough for me to need like another set of eyes to tell me where to go because I mean, I can just figure that out. I have enough experience climbing that I just, I can figure out where to go. Jessica Barons 5099 said, are there any adventures you've done by yourself where you think to yourself afterwards that you probably shouldn't have risked it? Love the channel. I can think of one time. There's a mountain in Zion National Park and I, I filmed this, this is, this is a video. I'll put links to that video and everything else that I talk about in this, in this video in the description down below. A mountain called South Ariel Peak and there's one spot, so on, on the way up it was fine, it's like a, basically like a slick rock mountain, it's all solid rock. And some spots, spots get, you know, relatively steep. And going up wasn't a problem, but coming down, um, you know, coming down is almost always harder than going up. It's just more awkward, uh, it feels less natural. And so I was going down this one spot where it was pretty steep, it was like the steepest part of the climb. And I remember thinking, if I fall here, this is the end, like this is, this is bad. I should not be in this situation. And it's just very kind of insecure because it's not like there are lots of handholds and footholds. It's just smooth rock. And so it's a little bit, a little bit tenuous, uh, but I did make it down obviously. And uh, I think there's an easier way actually to get down. I think I should have gone down a different way. So my fault, but uh, yeah, usually it's not, not a problem. Beatrice Boggs 9090 said, I'm curious as to what nighttime is like when you sleep in such remote places. Do you ever hear any wild animals come near your car? Do you take any precautions for safety? Precautions for safety, I lock the car and I have, you know, I have, I have bear spray with me or like within arm's reach in the car. And uh, do, do I ever hear any wild animals? Coyotes, I hear coyotes all the time, howling and yipping off in the distance, sometimes not that far away but never had any, any problems with them. Let's see, Easton LaChapelle 6402 said, ever feel anything spiritual or supernatural out of any sites? I grew up around the four corners and every so often we would stumble upon an Indian ruin that gave everyone the feeling that we should leave. Uh, I've never really had that kind of feeling, like a feeling of foreboding or, or fear that I should get out of a place because I wasn't welcome there or wanted there or anything like that. Never felt that. Again, I'm, I'm kind of boring in this regard. Like, I'm a pretty boring person. I, I do interesting things, but like, I'm pretty boring. So I, I've never felt anything like that. But uh, as far as feeling something spiritual or supernatural, there was one hike in particular that I did in Southern Utah uh, several year, uh, a few years ago now. It was Bullet Canyon to Sheik's Canyon or Sheik's Canyon. And there were tons of Indian ruins, tons of Native American ruins on that hike. And some were really well preserved. And, and there's one that's been kind of partially reconstructed. It's a kiva. It's like a circular underground uh, Native American meeting place, basically. And there's a, there was a ladder in place there. Like you, you could go down and be underneath, be underground there in that little circular chamber. And I think in places like that, it's more reverence that I feel than anything else. Uh, I, I never feel anything too, uh, too foreboding or, or scary. Terry H said, do you carry a satellite communication device? Yes, I have a Garmin InReach Mini that I pay, I think $12 a month for. Uh, it can track me, but usually I don't have it tracking. Usually I just have it as an emergency device. So if I'm in a place where I don't have cell phone reception, I can press the SOS button on that and a helicopter or whoever will come and, and rescue me. And kind of along those same lines, uh, Jay Jansen 50 said, when you are scrambling, bouldering, etc., do you clip your Garmin? So the, again, the little in-reach mini uh, satellite communication device. Do you clip that to an easily accessible spot so you can call for help if needed? Usually no, I should. I should have it like clipped onto my, my shoulder strap. My bigger backpacks that I usually use while hiking have a little, a little pocket uh, on, the, on the left shoulder strap here. And so I should just clip it to the shoulder strap and put it in that pocket so that I always have it, have it with me. But I, I don't, but I should. Mr. Firewood Zipline said, have you been to Blue John Canyon in Utah where Aaron Ralston had to cut off his arm to get out? If not, could you go there and show us what happened and tips on how to avoid this issue? 
So yeah, he's the guy who, who got his arm stuck in a boulder. I think he was, he was in a slot canyon and he was climbing around the boulders and he had his arm up like this or, you know, behind a boulder and the boulder shifted and it pinned his arm. And so he had to use like a, a dull Swiss army knife basically to cut his arm off. Just a crazy story. And uh, I've never been there. I don't really do too much solo technical canyoneering as far as like canyoneering that has rappels and stuff. I think the lesson there is A, to either go with other people, which I'm not gonna do all the time personally, but if you wanna be as safe as possible, you go with other people. And then B, uh, he just got unlucky. You know, he just stuck his arm there in the boulder. I'm sure thousands of people have done that canyon and done what he did. He just got unlucky. For whatever reason, the boulder shifted, pinned his arm. And uh, I don't think he had told anyone about where he was. So that's another thing you, you want to do if you're out there alone, especially. Old Dan's Travels said, what's the scariest mountain you have ever climbed? To be honest, they're not scary <laughs> to me. Like I don't feel fear really when I'm up climbing these, these slightly sketchy mountains. There is a mountain in Utah called Temple Mountain. And again, I made a video about this and I'll put it down below that had a few different sections where most people would probably want a rope. Like the vast majority of people climbing that would probably want a rope. I didn't. Um, I was, you know, a little bit nervous, but it was fine. Uh, and I, I always say this, and I do think this is true. If I feel uncomfortable, I'm just going to back down. You know, I'm not going to, if, if I'm scared, if I'm that scared, I'm not going to keep going. I'm just going to retreat and you guys will probably never see the video. Um, but I don't think that's ever happened. I don't think I've ever, I've ever backed off a, of a climb that you guys didn't see. But yeah, again, I'm pretty boring and I, I, I don't really get scared when I'm up on those mountains. I get, uh, it's more of a challenge than anything else. That's why I do those. I don't do it for like the adrenaline rush or anything like that. It's, it's a challenge. I, I like being in, in, a, in a remarkable position, like on a ridge on the side of an exposed mountain. And I like the challenge of figuring out how do I do this? That's, that's basically it. Chris G said, okay, I'm gonna be the one to ask. Have you ever seen a UFO out in your very remote places? Again, sorry, no, I haven't. And along the same lines, you've been at this for a long time, must have some strange stories. What's the weirdest or oddest thing you've experienced? Come on, man. Again, the world is not as scary as most people think it is. Uh, I, I, I spend a lot of time in, in these places and I, I don't have any issues. And then finally, for this category, given that your primary area these days seems to be the southern border area, do you ever encounter sketchy situations? Also, do you feel secure in your nice vehicle at night? with the potential for danger in your area. I've never had any sketchy situations near the border and I've camped within a couple miles of the border several times, never had any issues. Also, do you feel secure in your vehicle at night with the potential danger in your area? Yeah, uh, I mean, if, if I am in, a, in a, an area close to the border and I'm camping, like those people, they don't want anything to do with, with me or anyone else really. They just wanna do their thing, whatever that is and uh, not be detected basically. So no, I've never had any issues. So that wraps it up for safety and encounters. Number two is finding campsites and trip planning. <sighs> Let's keep hiking. Minimalist adventurer asked, finding camping spots through an app or map is one thing. Say you are out traveling and stumble upon a place that seems like a good camping slash boondocking spot. What are the steps one takes to validate if it is safe or legal to camp there? Well, like I said, regarding safety, I think anywhere basically is safe. So I'm not really gonna touch on that. I, I, I've never not camped in a spot because I, I have felt unsafe there. As far as whether it's legal to camp there, really what you need to do is figure out whether you're on public land or not. So most of the time, especially in the Western US, this is BLM land and national forest land. If you are on that land, you're good to go, basically. Unless like, you know, sometimes the, the apps or the, the maps aren't entirely accurate. For example, like if there's a house down the road, don't park right in front of their house, even if it is surrounded by national forest land, just use common sense. Uh, but yeah, basically find the public land. And to do that, you need an app. Uh, the app that I use is called Gaia. It's a paid for app. And that's probably one of the, the most valuable, if not the most valuable tools that I use for my adventuring. Gaia is an excellent app. Uh, it's an offline mapping app. It has, it has trails marked on there. You can have different layers. So like you can have your base map, then you can put a public land overlay on top of that map. And if you download that before you go out, go out on your trip, even if you don't have cell coverage, you can 
Uh, it'll, it'll show you where you are on that map and if you are in public land. There are other apps that can do this. I think Onyx, the various Onyx apps can do that if you don't want to use Gaia. And then uh, there's, a, there's an app that I think is called like US Public Lands or something like that. It's, it costs a few dollars and same kind of deal. Uh, basically all it does is, is tell you whether you're on public land or not. And then also what kind of public land that is. So national forest, BLM land, national park, uh, you know, fish and wildlife service, whatever, whatever the, the relevant area is. And then also I use a website and an app called CalTopo for various parts of my, my trip planning. And again, I think they, they're, even their free version has an option where you can toggle the, the overlay of the public land. I don't think that works offline, but uh, if you do have cell service, that's a quick and easy way to, to figure that out. Manny Van Adventures said, I've seen you talk about using Google Maps before, but do you have any other tips on finding great campsites? Uh, this always stresses me out on my road trips. Uh, again, the first is to find public land. That is, I mean, if you take nothing else from the vi from this video, have it be that. You have to find public land. So to do that, you need an app. Or again, uh, you don't necessarily need an app. It can be a map. So I use the, the Benchmark series of atlases. I have ones for each of the Western states. They're great, great atlases. And they do have uh, the, the boundaries of public land marked in there. If you don't, want to use an app or if you are offline and don't have access to, to finding that information on your phone. And then really, I just find public land and I drive down dirt roads on public land until I find campsites. Uh, I think people try to make this super, super complicated, but the vast majority of my, of the campsites that I find are found that way. I figure out where the public land is, I drive down dirt roads on that public land until I find campsites. And if possible, I'll use the Google Maps satellite view to see what the roads look like, see if there are any little like smaller roads that branch off into little like what look like little cul-de-sacs because that, uh, that is what a good campsite will look like on Google Maps. I'll try to find one and put a picture of it on the screen so you guys can see what I'm talking about. Hanson Air Photo said, how do you decide where you're going next and how far ahead of time do you plan your trips? Uh, weather? and where I feel like going. So like the time of year, the season, and then the weather dictates where I go next. So for example, in winter, I'm not gonna be going to Montana, I'm probably not gonna be doing too much stuff in Wyoming. In winter, I go to Southern California, go to Arizona, New Mexico, Nevada, uh, even a little bit of Southern Utah. But then also it's just where I feel like going. So for example, I'm, I have a trip coming up and I, I had originally planned for this to be a Southern Utah trip, but I didn't feel like it. Like, I don't feel like going to Southern Utah. I've been there a tremendous amount and I feel like going to Colorado and New Mexico instead. And so that's, that's where I'm gonna go. And then how far ahead of time do you plan your trips? Because I go on so many trips, I don't plan multiple trips ahead. I plan basically the next trip that I'm doing. I might be kind of formulating some ideas of what I might want to see and do on future trips, but really as far as planning goes, it's always just the next trip. That is the the priority. And then when it comes to actually planning for a trip, I'll sit down and spend a full day planning that trip uh, before the, usually it's, it's like the day or two before the trip. I'll spend a full day on my computer. I'll be looking at, you know, the notes I've made about the various places that, that I want to go to, see what things I have kind of generally in mind. And then I'll also do some additional research on a specific area and see, see what I feel like, like doing and seeing. Dave Doe said, I have used CalTopo. What other websites or resources do you recommend to finding unusual points of interest in your target land areas? Google Maps is surprisingly helpful. Just, I would say go to the, the terrain view, like so you can see the, the, topo the topography, like the mountains and everything. Go to that view and then just like zoom in and see, what, see what's there, see what you can find. You'll see historical sites, you know, other points of interest, scenic areas, mountains, waterfalls, trails. It's a super, super good resource. Apart from that, Roadside America, Atlas Obscura, and then there are regional sites that I'll use. So for example, if I'm in Western Colorado, I'll use GJ Hikes, which is Grand Junction Hikes. Uh, Road Trip Ryan is great for Utah. Stavislost.com is great for Nevada and, and surrounding states. Uh, basically you find, it's really nice when you can find websites or blogs or, or, or 
what YouTube channels of a specific area, then just you know dig deep on that person's content and see see what looks good. And then guidebooks. Uh, I, I have a lot of guidebooks. I got two new guidebooks in the mail uh, in the last couple of days. Guidebooks are, I think, the most underrated and underutilized resource for trip planning. And finally, Dixie Lambrecht said, what do you do when it's getting late and you haven't found a camp spot? Uh, this is probably the hardest situation when it comes to finding a campsite. It's dark uh, or it's getting dark and you need to find a place to camp and it's I mean, you can't like really see what's down all these side roads that you're passing. And so it can be helpful to, again, look on Google Maps to get a better view of, of whether this dirt side road dead ends in 50 feet at a nice little clearing in the forest, or if it goes, you know, 20 miles through this canyon and up and over the next mountain. And then also, don't be picky at night. Increasingly, I find myself, because I do so much during the day, I increasingly find myself having to find campsites at night. Just kind of lower your expectations. For example, pullouts on the side of the road. Great, you know, if it's just one night, that's great. Just pull over, park there. Again, as long as you're on national forest land. And again, go down a, a kind of a major dirt road and then try to look for, for things going off the side there. And then also things like roads that parallel power lines are really good because most people aren't going to be camping there because it's not super pleasant to have power lines buzzing above you. But again, if it's just one night, it's fine. And uh, there are almost always cleared spots kind of at the, the base of the, the pylons of the, of the big, the big uh, towers. And so those would be my tips. Uh, don't be picky. Look for easy wins, just little pullouts, uh, like snowmobile staging areas or like, like kind of parking lots, trailheads, if, it's, if you're allowed to do it. To, to do that there. Uh, yeah, that's, those are my tips for, for nighttime campsite finding. On to topic number three now, which is vehicle talk. So questions about my vehicles and other vehicles. Huggy D said, we see your adventures taking you off road, but you never, uh, but we never see you airing up or down. How do you mitigate the soft stuff? I'm gonna say something very controversial that people are gonna get mad at me for. I have never once aired down my tires. And I've never once had any problems that I think would have been fixed by airing out my tires. Had I aired out my tires, I would have, wouldn't have gotten into that situation. Uh, I think it's a little bit overrated. I think the best thing to do is to do that to, to soften the, the ride a little bit. Like if you're on a really rocky, bumpy road, airing down the tires can definitely help with just the comfort of the ride. It can also help, you know, wear and tear on your tires and your suspension and all that stuff. But as far as needing to do it to like not get stuck, I've never done it, never had any issues with it. And I do have the, you know, the, the little gauge dial thing that you stick into the, the tire stem, into the valve and, and you air down your tires that way and it'll tell you what your PSI is. I just never use it. D Gemini 2 said, I'm curious about how much you have to spend on car maintenance and repairs each year. Uh, I don't have the, the number, the exact number off the top of my head, but the RAV4, very little beyond, you know, oil changes and stuff like that. My wife's Toyota Highlander, very little. Uh, the Land Cruiser this last year was quite expensive. Uh, there were some major repairs. I don't even remember what they were. It's probably like $5,000 worth of repairs to the Land Cruiser. And not really just like repairs, but like replacing stuff. I mean, I guess that is repairing it, but it's a 24 year old car at this point and stuff has just worn out. Stuff just needed to be replaced on it. And the Land Cruiser, probably after this camera, is the single most important tool I have for my job. And so I'm fine spending, you know, whatever I need to on it. So yeah, the Land Cruiser, several thousand dollars this last year. Uh, this year, I'm, I'm not going to be spending that much because last year was the first full year that I had it. And I took it to a place a few times in Utah, I think it's in Murray, so in the Salt Lake Valley. It's called State Automotive. And they're basically a Land Cruiser shop. They specialize in Land Cruisers. And so, you know, I, I took it there and they told me what, what needed to be done and I did it and I paid the money and we did a lot of preventative stuff too, just to make sure that when I am out in the middle of nowhere and something does go wrong, uh, well, to, to prevent that, <laughs> things won't go wrong. You know, we take care of them before that happens. Okay, Richard Haney said, I've watched several of your videos describing your approach to RVing in Toyota SUVs. But lots of people point out that even though reasonably well-maintained Toyota SUVs are very reliable, very well-built, largely trouble-free vehicles, 
Such SUVs are in very high demand and thus are usually not available at a reasonably affordable price. What else can you recommend? You know, I'm not, I'm not really a car guy. I like Toyotas because they are reliable. If I weren't to get a Toyota or, or you know, a, a Subaru or a, a Honda or any, any of those, uh, I'd probably just get, I don't know. I mean, I, I did buy a GMC Yukon a few years ago. I liked that car. Uh, it had some, some issues, but you know, every car is gonna be, is gonna have some issues. No car is, is completely trouble free. Uh, and so I'd probably get something like that, you know, a Chevy Tahoe, GMC Yukon, a Suburban. Uh, if you wanted something smaller, I don't know, are Ford Explorers good cars? I, I don't really know because I'm not, I'm not really interested in that market. I like Japanese SUVs and they are more expensive, but I would just save up. I mean, if I, if I had the luxury of time, I would save up a little bit more and get, get one of those vehicles, even though they are, I mean, they are more expensive. If my current car broke down right now and I had like under $5,000, I would probably get, yeah, something like a Chevy Tahoe. The Weed in Your Garden said, I have a question regarding your vehicles. I know you've used a Toyota RAV4 and the Subaru, now the Toyota Land Cruiser. I've never had a Subaru, so I don't know where that came from, but uh, I'm thinking about a Toyota uh, 4Runner as something intermediate, which to live temporarily in and good for accessing remote locations. Is it not as good as the Land Cruiser? Uh, I think if I could only have one car, if I couldn't have both the Land Cruiser and the RAV4, I would probably have a 4Runner. 4Runners are awesome. They'll get you to wherever you need to go. I like Land Cruisers just because they're they're bigger. I just like them more, and they are built tougher. Like that's why they're they're more expensive vehicles even than 4Runners, which as the previous uh, questioner said, you know, Toyota SUVs are not especially cheap, but Land Cruisers are just overbuilt. They are extremely tough vehicles. Uh, and I've, I've always wanted one, and so I bought one. Uh, but for you, I think a 4Runner, I mean, for me, a 4Runner would be just fine. I just like, I just like Land Cruisers. But 4Runners are awesome. They're great. Phil Yamora said, if money wasn't a factor, what's one upgrade to the Land Cruiser you would make? Really, it's, it's how I want it to be already. I would just bank that money, keep it for repairs, because again, even though the Land Cruiser is a super robust platform, things always go wrong, and so I would just keep it, keep it for, for that. Uh, I, I bought this particular Land Cruiser because it already had a lift, it already had upgraded suspension, it already had big tires, it had a lot of things done to it. And you know, I'm, I'm not the kind of person who, who really cares that much about their cars, to be honest. It's a tool for me to use for my adventures. The car itself is not like the final destination that for a lot of people, I think it is like a lot of, a lot of forerunner people, a lot of Jeep people, their thing is like kitting out their car, upgrading their vehicle. To me, you know, the, the, the Land Cruiser does everything I need, I need it to. The RAV4 even does, you know, a good amount of what I need it to. So I'd save that money either for repairs or for trips in the future. How much do you spend on gas in an average month? Uh, there is no average month. Some months I'm gone for two or three weeks. Some months I'm not traveling at all. It also depends on the the vehicle that I'm in. I can spend $1,000 on gas in a month if I'm in the Land Cruiser. And if I'm going for, you know, a couple weeks, I can spend $100 a day on gas if I'm traveling, if I'm driving a lot, you know, between filming locations and, and driving a lot during the day. Yeah, $1,000. That's pro it's probably the upper end. The RAV4 gets gets twice the fuel economy that the, the Land Cruiser does. So if I were to do the same trip in the RAV4, it would be $500. Uh, but I mean, there's there's a ton I could do on two or $300 a month. I just like to go pretty far out for, for some of the places that I that I feel like going to. Pipes136 said, what is the best SUV RV that also doubles as a daily driver? I would say something like the RAV4 or, you know, a small, small SUV. So RAV4, Honda CRV, Subaru Forester, those are the ones that I would get. Uh, they're very fuel efficient. They have enough clearance and a short enough wheelbase that, you know, you can get to a lot, a lot of places with those vehicles and they're reliable. They're fun and easy to drive, you know, on the highway day to day for your commute, but they're also good adventure rigs because I think in all three of those, I know the RAV4 and the Forester have have the the second row of seats that folds down flat so you can just fold down those seats and toss a camping mattress in i don't know if the crv does i've never 
I've never really looked at CRVs, but I'm I'm guessing they their seats probably do that too. So small Japanese SUVs is what I would go with. The next category, category number four, is places I've been. Contrail Kid 15 said, one place you've been that still amazes you every time you go and draws you to go there. Really, in general, it's any any very rugged, very rocky mountain range. Uh, especially for me, it's the Wind River range because I live an hour and a half from the southern end of the Wind Rivers. Uh, but also places like the Sawtooths or the Sierras, uh, just very craggy, very toothy peaks. That's that's the kind of place that I, I can't seem to keep, uh, to, to stay away from. They always keep bringing me back in. What is the most underrated area in the West? I think Idaho is probably the most underrated state followed by Wyoming and Nevada. All three of those states have just incredible places that no one has ever seen or heard about. But Idaho especially is just a really beautiful place. It doesn't really have any national parks. I mean, it has a little sliver of Yellowstone, but there aren't really super well-known places, but the vast majority of the state is just beautiful. Like the, the, the middle of the state and the north, once you get into the mountains and all the rivers that are in there, it's just, Awesome country, epic, epic country. My arms are getting kind of tired of, of holding the, the tripod. So this camera is on a tripod and I'm holding it out as kind of a selfie stick. And my, my forearms are getting tired. So you're gonna see me doing more of setting the camera down and, and uh, answering questions while sitting in a minute here. But anyway, Zambo Girl said, what is your bar none favorite travel video you've posted? I always like the ones that my wife are in. So I would say those. Then also I did one a couple years ago in the crazy mountains that's the name of the mountain range, the crazy mountains in Montana. And I went and found this glacier that had these locusts in it. Uh, the, the, the grasshoppers that, or the locusts or whatever had landed on the glacier and then a storm came in and buried them in the glacier. And this was a spot that I couldn't find any information about online. I couldn't, you know, there were no pictures, no reports of anyone going there, but I, I had read about it somewhere and I wanted to go there and I did and it was awesome, and I'll put a link to that video down below if you wanna check that out. Odyssey USA said, what's your favorite place you visited? Again, probably the Wind River Range. It's just an epically beautiful mountain range. And again, it's, it's kind of in my backyard now, which is one of the main reasons we moved here, which brings me to the next question, which is Yellowstone Jayhawk. He said, what part of Wyoming are you living in? I live near Cody, it's great. So we live in Rock Springs, Wyoming, which is kind of in Southwestern Wyoming. Cody, where this guy lives, is northwestern Wyoming. They're about four hours apart from each other. Cody's a cool place. I, I like Cody, but uh, we live in Rock Springs. Old Dan's Travels said, favorite place you've lived in in the U.S.? I mean, it's probably Rock Springs. I, I really like it here. It's uh, I mean, this is literally like a few minutes down the road from where I live. This is BLM land, just nothing out here. I love it. I love that Rock Springs is just kind of a little town. It's like 30,000 people. It's not tiny, but you know, it's got everything you need. It, I love that it's not connected to anything else. It's not endless suburbs out here. There's Rock Springs and that's it. And I love that because it leads to places like this all around. Like the, the city is just surrounded by nothing. It is so vast out here. I like that there's no traffic and I like being in the middle in between a couple of my favorite places the Wind Rivers that I've already mentioned several times, and the Uinta Mountains in Utah, which is the highest mountain range in Utah. That's like an hour over in this direction. So uh, I, I just really like being here. Then as far as overseas goes, I've spent a lot of time uh, overseas. I've spent probably six or seven years of my life living in other countries. Uh, Kathmandu, Nepal is awesome. I, I miss Nepal. Nepal is probably my favorite country uh, that I've traveled to. <laughs> that I still th think about it a lot. You know, I still think about, about Kathmandu and, and the Himalayas, obviously, the mountains there a lot. I wasn't there for super long. I think I've spent like three months in Nepal as a whole, but that, that probably is, if that counts as a place that I've lived in, uh, that would be my, my pick for places beyond this region. Philip Murrieta one says, what is the highest altitude you've ever climbed? I believe it is Kala Patar, which is a small little like rocky nub of a hill near Everest base camp in Nepal. It's 18,519 feet. I've been above 17 and 18,000 feet multiple times, but I think that's, that's the highest. I did do the trek to Everest base camp and I, I think that's the, 
highest spot I went on that trip. MDS Rats said, what is your favorite place in Utah? I mean, it changes. Right now it's probably the West Desert, which is a vast, empty part of Western Utah that doesn't have any one thing that's like really national park worthy, but it is empty and there's just millions of dirt roads and cool mountains and that's that's probably what I'm into most these days in Utah. David K said, do you and your wife like living in Rock Springs? And then he has another question here, but we'll cover that one first. Yes, we do. Uh, I think Cassie likes it. I love it. I think she would like to be in a place that's more green, less desert. I think if, if it were completely up to her, she would probably live in the Pacific Northwest somewhere. Uh, but for various reasons, we are we're here and I love it here. I love, again, I love that we're just so isolated from everything, but we still have everything that we need and we're three hours from family. So I have my, my mom lives in the Salt Lake area. Cassie's sister lives there, uh, which was one of the main reasons that we, that we moved here. We didn't want to live in Utah too, too many people, too much, eh. but here, I mean, we go to Utah like once a month still, but between those times when we're staying with my mom, we can be here and it's just like peaceful, quiet. Rock Springs isn't an especially pretty city as far as like the town itself goes. It's kind of a crumbling old town, but uh, I, I really like it here. And then the, the next question is, what would your top five places to live in be if you didn't have to worry about being close to any family member? So I'm gonna add to that affordability. Like there are certain places that I will probably never be able to afford to live even if I, if I did want to live there. And so we're gonna go like places where you can still buy a house for like $300,000, let's say, which is, you know, kind of reasonable. Uh, number one on that list is probably Butte, Montana. Cassie and I both really love Butte. It's just a, a cool old mining city, beautiful location, neat stuff to do there, cool old buildings. Also on that list is Grand Junction, Colorado. I think you can still buy a house there for 300,000. Uh, I like Baker City, Oregon, which is a little town in Eastern Oregon that has like 10,000 people. I just like that area and the town itself is, is kind of cool. Also in Oregon, Klamath Falls, which again, isn't like an amazing town, but to me, a town isn't amazing if it's not affordable. Like exp expensive places don't really interest me very much. Uh, I like places that are a little bit more <laughs> like run down, a little bit cheaper. A little bit more affordable. And then last on that list is probably Kingman, Arizona, which again, I think is probably gonna surprise some people because it's not that great of a town. I just like where it is in Western Arizona. You can get you know, to the places like Sedona and Flagstaff within a couple hours. You can get to the other places in the Mojave Desert of Southern California uh, in, in within a couple hours. Las Vegas is an hour and a half or two hours away. And it's super, super cheap because again, it's not like the nicest town in the world. To me, towns don't matter. Like the city itself does not matter. I'm interested in, in what's around the town, what I can do from that place. That's what really interests me. That's probably what makes me different from, from a lot of people. And then finally, Ann Hikes and Powerlifts asked, what is the best thing about living in Wyoming? I like that there's no state income tax. I like the wide open spaces and I like the access to, uh, to uncrowded outdoors. And that brings us to category number five, which is future travel plans. We're gonna go through these pretty quick. Chad B said, what bucket list hike anywhere in the world have you not done yet? I don't really think about that too much. Like I'm so consumed with the Western US that like, you know, I know what's out there, but I love this part of the world. And so I, I don't really focus too much on stuff outside of the US, but I did learn recently about a, uh, a trail called El Camino de Costa Rica. So it's a trail, I think it's 170 miles that goes across Costa Rica. I think that would be an awesome, adventure to do. Uh, also a couple of mountains that I'd like to do. Uh, Aconcagua on the Chile-Argentina border is the highest mountain in the Americas, North and South America. It's like 22,000 feet. I would like to do that. And then Pico de Orizaba, which is the, I think that's the highest in Mexico. It's the highest volcano in North America. I would like to do that also. Wandering Sailor said, will you be crossing the Mississippi River again? Uh, or the East Coast? And so I got a lot of questions about this, like when will I go to the East and what will I do in the East? Uh, whether it be the, the Southeast or the Appalachians or the Northeast. Uh, I have a trip planned in May of this year. So I don't know when you guys will see this video, but in like May, June, I'm going to be doing a cross country trip, literally across the country from coast to coast, from San Diego to probably North Carolina. And I bought, I have a new 
adventure rig, a new expedition rig, new expedition vehicle we'll call it, that you guys have not seen yet. If you're an Adventure Know How member, you've seen it, because I've done a couple of videos about, um, about the, the vehicle when I bought it, and also the trip that I have planned. So if you want to see more details about that, before it appears on the main channel here, go sign up for Adventure Know How. And so to answer the question, I'm going to be going to the southeast in, yeah, in like May, June-ish. As far as stuff north of that, like going, getting up into, you know, the mid-Atlantic states and then the, the northeast, I don't know. Uh, I don't have plans to go there anytime soon. I wouldn't be surprised if I went to the northeast sometime in the next couple years but I don't have any definitive plans. Will you be traveling to see the 2024 eclipse? So I'm recording this before the eclipse. I think you guys will see this video after the eclipse. No, I'm not traveling to that. Uh, I've just got other travel plans, other stuff that I'll be doing. Uh, it'd be great to see, but it's, it's far and I've got other stuff that I'd, I'd rather do that's closer to home. Barry Raven said, you've been to so many places in the US. Do you think you'll ever run out of places? Yes and no. Will I ever run out of like top tier, super interesting, awesome places to make videos about? Maybe. But will I run out of kind of obscure mountain ranges or, you know, backwoods areas to explore? No. I mean, there's, there, there are multiple lifetimes of, of interesting places in the West. Uh, places that, like, make for, like, super awesome, interesting, engaging videos are a little bit, little bit less, you know, not quite as prevalent. But I'm fairly certain I could make videos for the rest of my life exploring just, again, all these obscure little mountain ranges. Alex T. Oder said, you love being submerged in seldomly visited nature. Why don't you do multi-day hiking? There are a couple of reasons to this. So I don't do a ton of backpacking on this channel. I do do it occasionally, but I've done a lot of backpacking in my life. First of all, I've, I've through hiked the app, not the Appalachian Trail, the, uh, the John Muir Trail. I've done the, the Tahoe Rim Trail, which goes around Lake Tahoe, which is like 165 miles. I've done the Wonderland Trail Mount, around Mount Rainier. I've done the Lone Star Hiking Trail, which is the longest trail in Texas. It's like, I don't know, 70 or 90 miles, I don't remember. I've done quite a bit of backpacking in my day. The main reason I don't do it too much now is the opportunity cost. It's like the, the next question here. Any chance of you doing the PCT or AT? So that's the Pacific Crest Trail or the Appalachian Trail, which, you know, take four or five, six months to do. They're a couple thousand miles long. No, no chance. Uh, opportunity cost is a huge reason of that. I don't want to be making the same video every day for five months. In the amount of time it would take me to hike one of those trails, I could do so many other videos and I'd rather do all that other adventuring than one through hike of a long distance trail. Also, my knees aren't as good as they used to be. I think I could do, you know, multi-day trips, but I think that the doing a, a, a hike for four, five, six months at a time would, would not be possible. I think my knees uh, just aren't, aren't good enough for that anymore. And then also, I just don't want to be away from my wife for four, five, six months at a time. You know, going away for a week or two or three uh, is fine, is doable. I don't want to be away for, for half the year. Coach Wendy has two questions. She said, I enjoy your kayaking and biking videos along with hiking. Do you plan to continue with the e-bike and kayak videos? Yes, I do. Uh, I think a lot of people think of these as kind of, um, as hiking videos, like this is kind of a hiking channel. I don't think of it that way. I think of this as an adventure channel. Hiking is, re is required to reach a lot of interesting places. So I do a lot of hiking, but like, really I'm just interested in seeing and doing cool stuff. And so whatever medium is required to do that, is, is what I'm interested in. And so that's why I do like the, like the pack rafting and the kayaking and the, the multi-day biking stuff. I, I do really enjoy that. And yes, that will definitely continue. You will be seeing more of that. She also says, if you have time to do updated videos to share about your equipment, that would be great. I agree. I'm thinking of, of starting a new channel that's just gear talk, gear reviews. I don't like doing that on this channel. It's not super interesting to me as far as like doing top 10 lists or anything like that, but I understand the appeal of making videos that are just a review of a single item. And so people searching for, for reviews of that thing on YouTube can find that. Uh, and you know, it wouldn't be like a super high priority, but I have a lot of gear. I like gear. It's fun to talk about. I have things to say about gear. And again, I already have it, so I might as well make videos about it. I don't necessarily want it to be videos on this channel, but I might make quick reviews on another channel in the future. Let me know if that's something that you guys would be interested in. Jay Smallen said, have you considered a trip to Baja, so Baja, Mexico, for some exploring, hiking, rock art, cave art, etc.? 
Does Baja interest you at all? Looks like a great winter option. So yes, um, I've done one Baja video and it wasn't super well received. I think my, I think a, a portion of my audience is, is older and I think a lot of them are a little bit scared of going to Mexico, to be honest. Uh, I think the people are much more interested in Canada than Mexico. Having said that, I love Mexico. I've spent like seven months in Mexico before. I really like Mexico. Mexican people are great. The food obviously is great. The history is fascinating. I, I enjoy Spanish, the language. Like I've been studying Spanish for the last couple years. So I would very much like to go do more in Mexico. Does that include making SUVR videos in Baja? Maybe, sure, occasionally. Like I'd be fine with doing another one or two videos there a year, but I'm not gonna do super extensive travels there because I, I wanna make videos that you guys are interested in, that the majority of you are interested in, and I think the majority are just not super interested in Mexico, which is sad because I love Mexico, but you know, that's fine. Bandred1 says, have you ever tried or thought about exploring wild caves? Uh, I've gone to probably like 30 or 40 caves over the course of this channel. I've been to a lot of caves. I'm not super interested in like spelunking, in like technical caving, but just going and exploring caves I think is fun. Yeah, I, I've done that and I will continue to do that in the future. Colorado native said, I remember that you stated you were going to be traveling to Alaska a few years back. I know that was delayed due to your father's passing, but I was still wondering if you are planning on taking that trip. Yes, well, that trip, no. Uh, maybe at some point in the future, like I was gonna do a, a, a big one or two month long trip up through Canada and Alaska. That version of that trip will not happen, but I will be going to Alaska this year, fingers crossed. It'll be a little bit of a different kind of, of Alaska trip, but I, I, it is, it is in the cards, I think. And kind of along those lines, are you coming to Alberta this year? There is epic hiking in the Canadian Rockies. Alberta, probably not this year, maybe, but probably not. Uh, British Columbia, definitely. Um, Alberta, I don't know, we'll see. Any plans to have a fan meet and greet, like an SUV RVing expo? Meet and greet, maybe. Expo, probably not. That sounds like too much work. Uh, I'd rather just go off adventuring than try to like organize an expo. But I have thought about just like renting a pavilion in a park, probably somewhere in Salt Lake, because I know I have a lot of viewers in Northern Utah. So I might just go rent a park or, you know, rent a spot at a park for, for half a day and have you guys just come meet me and we can, I don't know, I don't know what else we would do. Like that's one of the reasons I haven't done it. Like, I don't know, apart from me, like sitting down at a table and like you guys coming to talk to me, like I, I don't know what else, what else to do. So give me suggestions if you have ideas for that. Risk Assure said, will you ever travel to Hawaii or more generally take a plane abroad, rent an SUV or RV and visit places and do a video on that? I think that is a possibility, probably not this year, but again, going back to Costa Rica, uh, I know that there are Jeeps with rooftop tents that you can rent down there. Uh, I know that in Iceland, there's a big like kind of rental overlanding community. Same with, with New Zealand and Australia. So possibly uh, those are just expensive, you know? And so again, it's with the opportunity cost. Like there's, if I have X amount of money, I could fly to Costa Rica and rent a car and that'd be awesome. Or I could spend like a summer <laughs> traveling in my SUV. So I don't know, we'll see, we'll see. Rick G said, do you have any desire to travel out of the States to do any exploration videos in other countries? If so, which ones? So I've been to a lot of places. I've been to, you know, 30 something countries, maybe. Yeah, I've been to several dozen countries. I've done a lot of traveling overseas in my day. As far as doing that these days, uh, again, I do like Mexico. I like Central America. I would like to go do some adventuring there. I think practically speaking, Canada is where I'm going to be spending time if I'm not in the US, maybe with a little bit of Mexico thrown in. But as far as places that like one day I might like to go, then, uh, you know, I'd like to do big trips in like Ecuador or Argentina, uh, just drive through the mountains and, and that sort of thing. This is a great question. Chris J says, if you could see 49 states and never go to the 50th, what state would you not go to and why that one? probably Delaware or Rhode Island. You know, no offense to those places, but I like mountains and deserts and those states have neither of those. Uh, you know, even other small states like New Hampshire or Vermont, I know have, have great scenery and nice mountains, but Rhode Island and, and Delaware are the two smallest states. And so if I had to choose one, I'd probably choose to not go to Delaware 
for no particular reason. I don't know, I've just heard more about Rhode Island, I think, than Delaware, so I would probably like to see some things in Delaware, like I, or in Rhode Island. Like I think Providence is supposed to be a nice, nice town, but I don't know. Let me know what you guys think. Should I, should I not go to, to Rhode Island or Delaware? Which one would you choose to forego if you had to? The average guy 12 says, would you consider going to the outback in Australia? It'd be interesting to compare and contrast, similar but different. Yeah, that'd be awesome. Again, time and money are, are the main issues with that, but that'd be, that'd be a fantastic adventure. I'd love to do that. To fly down there and, and rent or buy a rig and spend weeks just driving across the outback, that'd be sweet, that'd be awesome. Melrose B says, this is the final one in this category. Any plans to go to the Eagle Cap Wilderness in the Wallowas in Oregon? Is that right? Wallowas? 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 I've never really heard it out loud before. Uh, yes, maybe. Uh, it looks like a beautiful area. I don't know if this year it'll, it'll happen. I'm going to do two kind of mega trips this year. Big trips. The first trip is the one across, going across the country from west coast to east coast. The second one is, um, I won't tell you all of it, but going from here into basically all of the Pacific Northwest then up into Canada and, and beyond, we'll see. Uh, on that trip, I might go to the Wallowas, but I don't know. I haven't really planned out that trip in, in exquisite detail yet, so we'll see. So that was all for the future travel plans category. The next one is YouTube and filming. Why and how did you become a YouTuber? That's from Lynn Crab 61 So I started making videos because I had a book. I wrote a book called SUV RVing, which is still available. You can still go buy it on Amazon. It's a little bit, you know, I've, I've learned a lot since then, but it's still a good book, still has good information in it. I wrote that book and I wanted to sell more copies of the book. And so I've, I made videos about, about that, about how to turn your SUV into an RV to, to camp in. And the videos kind of took off and you know they helped me sell more books but then i could see the potential of of just focusing on on youtube and so i started to do that and the rest is history jacob.electric says do you batch record videos i.e a two-week trip hitting a bunch of spots and then weeks at home or what uh, yeah basically you you nailed it i'll go on a week on, on a trip for like a week or two or three or just an overnight trip it could be that too and get as many videos from it as I can and then come back and I spend, you know, weeks editing the videos. Then I go on the next trip and, and repeat. Dennis Kearney said, do you think you can do more land videos? I enjoyed watching the three properties. Yes, I will be doing more of those videos in the future. That video did extremely well and I will be doing more of them. How often do you go hiking on your own without any camera to just enjoy the scenery and be fully immersed in the experience? Does it feel strange now to hike without a camera or a mic? Uh, I'm out here, I mean, when when it's not winter, I'm out here once or twice a week hiking. As far as stuff beyond that, I don't do it super often because, like, if I'm at home, I'm working. And so I don't have time to go spend days hiking and not film it. Because, like, filming doesn't really affect the experience for me that much. Like, I'm fine with filming everything I do as far as hiking goes. It doesn't bother me. I enjoy doing it. I enjoy the actual filming part and I enjoy sharing it. And so dedicated me just going hiking for the joy of hiking, not a ton, again, except locally here, but it does happen a lot when I'm doing my fishing videos. So I have another channel called Tenkara Addict. I do a, a type of, of Japanese fly fishing called Tenkara. And on that channel, I film, I film me fishing, but I never really filmed the hike to get to the fishing spot. And sometimes it's like, hours of hiking and so I will do that with just you know just my thoughts or me listening to a podcast or whatever but apart from that I don't I don't do it very often when did you know you could go full-time on YouTube as another creator I'm always curious uh, after about three years I had a video just go viral get a million views and that video made something like nine thousand dollars or like the, the channel made something like nine thousand dollars in a month and I thought, oh wow, that is real money. And even before then, you know, I had, I was making less than that, obviously, but I could see the potential in it. 
and I, I've, I've kind of been doing these videos full time since the start. Like I, I started posting videos and I've never missed a week since. I, I've done I've done a video every single week for the last like seven years or however long I've had this channel. And so I've been doing it full time the whole time because I had other in income streams that I was making money from. So I could, I could, you know, I could spend a good amount of time on SUV RVing. But it took three years for it to get to a level where it was like, oh, this is like, real money. This is like a real living. And it's not always at $9,000, even years later, like that's, that's kind of rare. But, uh, you know, I make enough to live off of and, and that started at about the, the three year mark, give or take. Jerry Johnson says, I'm curious about your background in music. You seem to have varied and great taste in music. Thank you, Jerry, for saying that. Uh, basically, I, I get my music from two websites from Epidemic Sound and Artlist. And these are websites where you can, you, you subscribe to them, you have to pay, but then you can use the music in your videos. And so I do that. And I try to fo focus on acoustic, folk music, or like blues or country music, stuff that kind of fits the general feel of this channel. I'll, I'll occasionally branch out to like rock or even pop or even like electronic music sometimes, but usually it, it's, it's blues, folk, acoustic, country. That's kind of what I what I go for. Hobby Holic says, I have a second channel that I do travel videos on, so I know how much camera retrieval goes on in my videos. Yours look way more than what I do. How much time per hour of hiking do you spend placing and retrieving cameras? You do a great job of it. Looks like you have a film crew. Uh, it varies. Uh, I mean, never more than five or six minutes per time that I do it. Like if I were to set up the camera here and go walk off a few minutes off to the into the distance, that would get me pretty darn far away, and then I would come back to get the camera. So it's like max five or six minutes each time, usually much less than that, usually a minute or so. And depending on how long the hike is or whatever, it never really adds up to that much time. On a full day of filming, a full day of hiking, it could be maybe, maybe half an hour, but I don't, I don't think much more than that. And I've been hiking up this little canyon here. I'm kind of messing around on the rocks over this way. I think I'm going to go up onto this ridge now. So let's go cross down, cross the, the dry wash down here, and then go up this slope. There's some great views up there. Looney Spud said, what camera setup do you use? So I have a bunch of cameras. And the main one that I do most of the filming on, that I've done all the filming on in this video, is the Canon M6 Mark II. Usually I have the kit lens on here, which is I think a 15 to 45 milliliter, or milliliter, millimeter lens. Right now I have a, the wide angle lens on. This is an 11 to 22 millimeter lens. I have various other lenses. I have like a, an 18 to 150 super zoom lens. Then I have a, uh, a 16 millimeter f 1.4 prime lens or 1.6 prime lens that I use in low light situations. So that's the main camera. And then I have a, uh, kind of a tripod thing that I'm using as a selfie stick uh, that I'm using right now that I that I always use. And then I have a uh, Rode Video Micro microphone. I think that's the name of this of this mic. So that's it for this setup. And then the other cameras that I use, I have a uh, the drone is a DJI Mavic Mini. No, DJI Mini 4 Pro. I think it's what it's called. And I just got that this last year, and that's been great. I have three GoPro Hero 10 Blacks. I use one uh, on a magnetic mount on top of the car to get the, the, the GoPro time-lapse driving footage. I have another one that I use on my head for first-person stuff. Then I have another one that I use kind of as a backup and then also just various other little things that I need another little camera for. And then what else? I use my phone sometimes to film shots occasionally. It's, a, it's an iPhone 13 Pro. And then I have a 360 camera that I sometimes use, especially when I want to get kind of drone style shots, but I'm not allowed to fly the drone there. Uh, and that camera is the Insta360 X3. And I think that's about it for the main, the main camera gear that I use. Christine in Colorado said, how hard is it to learn to fly a drone and any beginner's tips? It's, it's very easy actually. Drones are very easy to fly because their default state, like if you, don't, if you don't touch anything on the controls, they just stay there, they, they hover. A drone, you know, it's, it's not gonna like fly off into the trees unless you tell it to go fly off into the trees. And so they're very easy to fly. They're just a little bit nerve wracking to fly because they're so expensive. 
you, know, you have this thousand or fifteen hundred dollar piece of camera gear and so the the prospect of of crashing that and losing it is is pretty unpleasant but it's it's really not bad drones are very easy and, and pretty fun to fly and as far as beginners tips go i would say just just go to a park or go somewhere like this where there's nothing around just practice flying it like put it on the ground launch it have it hover don't do anything you'll see that it just hovers there and then just slowly play with the controls and you'll figure it out it's it's very very easy and before you do that i would watch some youtube videos about how to fly the specific drone that you have matthew w wade says we have a joke in our home where we say don't forget your camera can you explain how you do that uh, so when i set up the camera i'll you know it's on a tripod right now and i'll set it up on the ground and i'll walk and I'll just walk back <laughs> and go pick up the camera. I've never, <clears throat> I've never really like lost the camera. Sometimes if I if I set it up and I, I go off for a few minutes, then come back, and if it's if it's like in bushes or among boulders and rocks, it might take me you know, a little bit of looking to see where exactly it was. But I've never really, uh, never really lost it. One time I was climbing a mountain <clears throat> in the Uintas in Utah, and I. I took my backpack off and I, I set, uh, I, I got the drone out and I, I flew the drone. And as I flew the drone, you know, I wanted footage of me climbing the mountain, like hiking up the side of the mountain. And so I had all my stuff down below on like a rock ledge. And so I, I had it all there and then I climbed up and then I couldn't really find my gear that I had left when I came back down. It took me a good like 15 minutes to find it just because I had ditched it like underneath a, a cliff or underneath a a ledge or something like that so that you wouldn't be able to see my backpack or my gear in the drone footage but I hit it a little bit too well and it did take me a little bit of time to figure it out but even that wasn't too too bad. I think I even had to like go into the the flight record of the drone so the the drone software will record where the drone is and so I had to go back and, and figure out where I launched the drone from and that is eventually how I found my stuff because I, I couldn't find it so that was, a, that was a fun experience. Thresher said, what would be your best piece of advice to anyone just starting an outdoor hiking slash camping channel on YouTube? I think the key is to, well, there are a couple of, a couple of keys. First, figure out what you can do differently. Figure out what you can offer. Figure out why people should watch your channel over other people's channels who are doing a similar thing. When I started SUVRVing the channel, there weren't really people focused on what I think of as van life in an SUV. No one was really doing that, like on a broad scale. And so I think that's one thing that I brought to the table. The second is that um, I, I'm good at finding obscure places and, and going to places that other people don't go. And then I'm also good at, uh, at like climbing mountains. And again, that's something that most people aren't really able to do, like do the pretty technical scrambling up up cool mountains. And so I think that's how I've differentiated me, how I've di differentiated myself in my videos. You need to figure out what works for you. Casual viewer said, do you make a full-time living off of YouTube at this point? Yes, and I have for about four years now at this point. Barry Raven said, do you have a backup plan in case YouTube income dries up? Yes, uh, I don't think, I'm not worried about the YouTube, the YouTube income drying up because even if I didn't get any money from YouTube ads, I would still have enough money from my other income streams, my other sources that we could survive, we could be fine. If YouTube like disappeared and I didn't have that as a channel uh, to, you know, promote my stuff, then that would be, that would definitely be tricky. But yes, I have, I have plans in case I have other, you know, I always have other irons in the fire. There's a lot going on behind the scenes. And uh, if YouTube disappeared today, it would be rough, but I'm confident that I'd be able to figure something out. G. Halame said, how long have you been making videos and what inspired you to pursue videography? Obviously love of the outdoors, but what else? So my first video, I, I have this noted down here. My first video was on October 26th, 2016. So that's about seven and a half years ago. And what else? Um, Video is just the best way I've found to convey how beautiful or interesting a place is. I've done it in the past with writing, like I've written several ebooks, 
and I've done a lot of blogging about interesting places. I've taken a lot of pictures, but for me, video is just really what captures a place. You can really get to get to know a place best through video, I think. And so that's kind of why I still keep making the videos. It's just a great way to to share places, basically. Versus dash ty 7 od says, I love and appreciate your videos, but does it ever concern you that you and other YouTubers are shining spotlights on less crowded places and will potentially make them more crowded for both future visitors as well as the locals that enjoy them? No. There are so many places out there that like me shining a little bit more light on one of them. I mean, there are, there are so many places out there, guys. Like, again, I could travel for the rest of my life and just focus on not crowded places and make videos about them and they would still not be crowded. I feel like the places that are already crowded are gonna get more crowded. Um, yes, YouTube and social media and guidebooks, you know, have, have brought to light some places that a lot of people didn't know about. I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. I think that any way, any reason, any excuse to get people outside is a good thing. I think that if you're a local, you don't really have much more ownership of a place than I do not being a local. Just being close to something doesn't mean you own it. Being born and next to something doesn't mean you own it. Me, as an American, I feel like I have just as much ownership over Yosemite National Park in California as I do over Yellowstone here in Wyoming or like this canyon where I am hiking now. Like, interesting and beautiful places will always attract people, whether I do it or not, whether all of us do it or not. I think that the locals who want to get away from it all will be able to do so if they really are like true locals. Like, I give me any. Give me any popular place in the Western US and I can find unpopular things to do and see there. I think that growing your skill set at finding those places and, and exploring on your own, doing your own research, um, that will serve you much better than just complaining about how there are people in your beautiful place. So I don't know if that offends people, but those are my thoughts on the subject. Cripple Creek Studios said, do you plan out your videos making a shot list or do you film what you can slash interests you and edit what you shoot. Uh, it's more of the latter. I don't have a specific list of like, okay, I need to get this shot and this shot and this shot. When I go on my trips, I have a list of things that I wanna see and do that day. And then I just film whatever I think looks good or, or whatever I think is interesting. The World of Flynn Sanity said, do you lay your drone on the ground for the walking away scenes? That's a lot of walking. No, the, the walking away scenes are always with the camera on a tripod on the ground. People always ask me, why don't I use the drone more to like, to do shots like that? And the answer is that drones are actually more, more of a hassle to get going to set up than you think. It's not just like, oh, let me pull the drone out of my pocket and oh, there it goes up in the sky. I have to put my bag down, you know, stop what I'm doing, root through the bag to get to the drone, unfold everything, unfold everything on, on the controller and the, the props on the, on the drone. Got to start it all up and then it's a process. It's not, it's not fast to get a drone going. It's way faster, way easier to just set the camera recording, put it on the ground, and then film me walking away and then coming back to get the camera. Hikerwood55 says, what video editing software do you use? I use Adobe Premiere Pro. Let's talk about some gear questions. This is category number seven, gear. Step into the wild said, no, step in into the wild said, what are five essentials to have with you on a first time car slash SUV camping adventure? Well, I made a list here, so I'll tell you. First, bed and bedding. Second, a way to cover the windows, so uh, to get some privacy. So this can be curtains or just black poster board that you've cut and put in the windows. Bug screens to go over the, the windows. So you can roll down the windows and have some fresh air, uh, but bugs won't get in and then a headlamp, and then finally food and water. And then fat to fit with Diane said, I find that the more I car camp, the more I dial in, uh, I dial it in and realize how little I really need. I've really paired back with what I take with me. Just wondering what is one thing that you just cannot live without that's like not really a necessity, but more of like something that you really enjoy. Uh, I, I have a, f a, a neck phone holder. So it's like this, this bendy wire thing that goes around here and then there's a magnet on it goes around my neck and I can stick my phone to it so that while I'm laying in bed, 
at night in my car. I can watch videos on my phone. It's kind of ridiculous, but I also kind of love it. She also said, I really need to have something to keep me busy once it gets dark. What are your must haves for entertainment? YouTube premium. So I pay the, I don't know, 14 or $15 a month, whatever it is for YouTube premium so that I can see YouTube videos without ads, first of all, but also I can download those videos to my phone. I watch way more YouTube than I do Netflix or Hulu or anything else like that. I, I barely watch anything else other than YouTube. So YouTube premium is my number one. And then I listen to a lot of audiobooks. Uh, so the Audible, I have, I have an Audible membership. So I get one, uh, one book credit a month. And then Libby is a free audiobook app that you connect to your, your library card. So you can borrow books from your library, including audiobooks. So I do that a lot. And then my Kindle, so I can read whatever I feel like reading. LDR1100RS says, could you talk a little bit more about your clothing system? Socks, pants, sunscreen hoodie. The hoodie in this episode is particularly sharp. So, okay, let's start with the socks. So I wear just whatever cheap, fully synthetic socks I can find for like a six pack at Ross. Right now I think I'm wearing Adidas socks, but I also use Puma or Champion, just like whatever cheap socks I can get at Ross for like $8. Uh, I like thin socks because I found that thin socks help prevent getting blisters. If you wear the thick, like chunky socks, I, I found that I get more blisters. So I use very thin socks. As far as pants go, uh, these pants that I'm wearing, the pants that I wear in almost all of my videos are the Mammoth or Mammut Run Bold pants. Awesome pants. Every pocket has several pockets. It's not like five or six pockets. Each one has a zipper on it, which I love. Very lightweight, they dry quickly. I can wear them when it's cold or hot, uh, but they're expensive. They're, they're like $120 per pair of pants. I am testing some like 30 and $35 pairs of pants that I bought on, on off of Amazon to, to just to try, but we're still in the testing phases. I don't have any definitive recommendations for you yet. Uh, my, my sun hoodies, these things that I wear, are one of two brands. I will put links to them in the description down below. One brand I think is called Alive, but the, like there's a number one instead of the I in there. And then the other brand is RBX. Uh, and the one that she, or that this person mentioned uh, was, was an RBX one. And then I have a zip up synthetic hoodie. This, this thing that I'm wearing, this, this black one that I'm wearing was like $13 at Walmart, works fine. Uh, my rain jacket is a Frog Togs rain jacket and it works super well. I love that jacket. It's pretty cheap too. My sunglasses are from a brand called Wear Me Pro, I think. Again, I'll put a link to those down below. Um, did I lose? I, I might have lost. I might have lost the sunglasses <laughs> that I was wearing. I had some sunglasses here earlier in the video. Not sure what happened to those. But uh, yeah, I'll put links to those down below. And then I, my down jacket is a Montbell down jacket. The shoes that I almost always wear are La Sportiva Wildcats. The ones that I'm wearing today are, are a different one. They're, <laughs> they're black and they're, they're high topped and they're waterproof. These are, I think, the La Sportiva Raptors. I think that's right. Uh, because it is still wet and a little bit snowy and muddy out here, I wanted to wear my waterproof shoes. And I think that's about it as far as clothes go. Fishing the list says, how do you handle hiking in icy and snowy conditions? What extra equipment do you use? Uh, waterproof boots are the most important thing. And then gaiters can be super helpful. Those are the kind of the tubes that go over your calf and over the top of your boot to keep snow from getting in. If you need to, snowshoes, trekking poles can be helpful. And then there's like mountaineering stuff. So I have, I have mountaineering boots, I have mountaineering clothing, like super waterproof stuff. I have crampons and ice axes. So it just kind of depends on what end of the winter hiking spectrum you're on. If you're just on a, a normal trail, flat trail with, uh, with some snow on it, yeah, waterproof boots will be fine. But if you do want to do more intense stuff and you'll need, you know, full on mountaineering gear and more specialized equipment. Indy Trent said, why do you never wear climbing shoes when you climb? Because they're not necessary. If I'm wearing climbing shoes, if I need to wear climbing shoes for something, that means that I probably shouldn't be climbing it alone in the first place. 
and I would need ropes and protection and things like that. The normal hiking shoes that I wear in my videos are made by, uh, by a company that makes climbing shoes, La Sportiva, and my hiking shoes have climbing rubber on them. And so they're very good at, at the, the scrambling and, and kind of low end rock climbing that you guys see me do in the videos. Plus having to carry an extra pair of shoes, it's, it's just not necessary. The, the shoes that I wear provide all of the, the grip and support that I need. If I do need something more, then I need to have someone else with me uh, when I climb that thing. A solo Joe journey said, what's something you keep in the vehicle that you found surprisingly handy to have? A spork. A spork within arm's reach of the of the driver's seat so in the center console or in the glove compartment i have this this titanium spork that i have in the land cruiser at all times and it's awesome you know you get you order food and you forget to grab the cutlery and it's just nice to have something you know at hand that uh solves that problem for you and then we are in category eight now the miscellaneous category Brian Williams said, suppose I am traveling and want to see some interesting sites while in the area. How do I search your videos since the titles do not state where they are? Two ways to do this. First, go onto YouTube on your computer, not your phone, but your computer. Go to my channel page where it says like videos, community, about, there are several kind of tabs. Next to those tabs is a little magnifying glass. Click on that and you can search my videos for free. So if you're going to California, search California in there. I don't know if it'll bring up all of my videos, but it should bring up enough to keep you busy. If you want more details, go to my website, Adventure Know How, sign up for a membership. That's kind of my version of a Patreon kind of deal, but you get, you get more than, than what I could offer if I just did it through Patreon. So you get like a map of my campsites, but you also get what I call the SUV RVing Trip Index, which is a list of all of my trips and the videos that I filmed on each trip and that's sorted both by state and chronologically. So I have a couple different sections. So you can click on whatever state you want and see all the videos that I've filmed in that state. Uh, or you can go to the year and see all the videos that I did in, in 2023, for example. And then also on Adventure Know How, I have what is called the, the video map, I think. And I've put on a map roughly where each of my videos was filmed. So if you're going to Southeastern Utah, Go to the map, you can see on that map where, you know, what, what videos I've, I've filmed in that area. Soul Journeying 360 said, when you summit a mountain and have experienced the awesome views firsthand, what do you feel? Is it a sense of physical accomplishment, spiritual, religious? I would say it is accomplishment. It's like, wow, I, you know, I reached the pinnacle. Like literally you've, you've, <laughs> you can't go any further. You've reached the top of the mountain. That's, that's just awesome. But then also just, awe, like a feeling of awe looking at the, at the amazing view, and then also joy of being able to experience such, uh, such beautiful and, and majestic scenery. So uh, it's not really a spiritual thing for me, more just like, wow, I guess is, is how I would describe it in one word. How do you manage condensation? That may be more of an issue out east. Yes, I think that is true. In more humid areas, you will have more condensation in your car while you're sleeping in it. To help fix that, always have your windows cracked as much as you can. Even in winter, if, even if it's like four degrees outside, my windows will be cracked because I need that fresh air to help, help combat the condensation. Also, having a fan in there, even just like a little battery-powered fan to help circulate the air can be super helpful. And again, even in winter, I've done that so that I don't wake up uh, with a, a windshield in the morning that's frozen on the inside. And then, what else? I think that's just about all that I do. I know some people do, uh, they, they, they buy damp rid, which is the stuff you can put like in your basement and it'll absorb the humidity in your basement and keep from mold growing down there. And I've heard of people doing that in their cars. I've never done it. I don't know how well it works, uh, but I know people do that. And also in their RVs too, they use that. So if you've done that, let me know how it's worked out for you. And then let's see, uh, I feel like my foot looks huge here because of how, how wide angle this lens is. Sorry if that looks weird. NDCW918 says, what is your favorite state of all to travel to? Historically, it's been Utah, but these days it's, it's more Wyoming just because I like exploring my new home state more. Tom Westbrook says, do you have any definite plans when V2 of your, uh, so when version two of your SUV RVing book will be published? 
No, I don't. It, it won't be anytime soon. Matt W. Kendall talks about uh, the best ways to stay connected while you're out on the road. I've used AT&T and Verizon, and I found Verizon to have the best coverage. Uh, but I, I don't really work on the road. Like, I'll, I'll check in occasionally, check email and stuff like that, but I don't need to be, like, on my computer all day if that, if that helps. So I would get, uh, you know, either, either a phone that you can use with tethering or just get a dedicated hotspot and use that to, to get on your laptop or whatever. And I, I don't have too much experience with those, so you'll probably, you'll probably want to look elsewhere to get some recommendations. Lulu and Bean Design says, what's the longest you've camped with your vehicle without having to fuel, replenish food, etc.? Probably around four days. Uh, I certainly could do more, but I, I don't really spend days at a time in one spot. I'm always on the move, and so, you know, I'm going to pass through a town at some point eventually. And so, yeah, a few days, probably. I could do more, but usually it's, it's a few days. Les Tucker says, do you see a lot of snakes? Would you consider filming more wildlife for your channel? I do see a lot of snakes. I see, I see a bunch of snakes every year. They're just kind of hard to get on camera because they see you coming and then they slither off into the bushes. Uh, or I'm just hiking like on the way to go fishing or on the way back from fishing and I'm not filming and I see snakes then. And so, yeah, uh, actually the last time I saw a snake was back over here. I was hiking here with Cassie and we got rattled on by a rattlesnake. Uh, that was in the fall and yeah, good times. As far as other animals, like would I consider showing other animals, showing more wildlife? It's not like I'm, it's not like I see the wildlife and then don't show it to you guys. Either I see it and I can't get it on, on film or I just don't see any. So, I mean, I show you what I can, but you know, I don't have control over the animals, so I can, I can only do so much. How many miles do you normally travel each year? Uh, I have the exact numbers here for you. Last year, it was 16,000 miles in the Land Cruiser, 7,000 miles in the RAV4, 10,000 in my wife's Toyota Highlander. And so that means 33,000 miles total. Uh, the 10,000 in the Highlander, so those aren't in the videos. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't really use that car for my trips, but we do use that car to go back and forth to Utah a lot and then just other non-business things. You know, just going around town, we usually use Cassie's car. So yeah, 33,000 miles. Phil Jamora asked, how do you do your dishes, laundry, and shower slash bathe while on the road for longer trips? Dishes, I don't really do dishes. I don't really cook on my trips. I either make sandwiches or buy stuff from the grocery store or, or you know, get takeout. And so I have basically a spork and some other utensils and a plate and that's, that's about it. So I just like wipe down, I wipe those down basically and, and rinse them off. For laundry, if it's two weeks or less, I will just bring enough clothes for the entirety of the trip. I have enough storage space in my, in my rigs, so I'm able to do that. If it's longer than that, then I'll just stop and go to a, a laundromat for a couple hours and, and wash everything. And then as far as bathing goes, usually I just go to a truck stop shower. I found those to be super fast and convenient. Not super cheap. They're like eight to $15 usually, but you know, I'm, I'm short on time when I'm doing that. So I'm, just trying to get in and get out and get clean and uh, those work well for me. Uh, RV parks or campgrounds also can work well. Uh, also rec centers. Even if you're not a, a local resident of a town, you can stop by their rec center usually and use their bathroom and their gym and everything like that. It's usually like six or eight dollars, not too bad. Moving on to category nine, questions about my wife. Campy Vansters says, curious why your wife doesn't join you for more of these adventures. Two reasons. First of all, she's she's kind of a homebody. She'd rather stay at home most of the time. Second of all, my trips are not vacations. They're not really relaxing. They are physically demanding. I wake up at like five in the morning and I hike or do whatever all day and I, I go to bed at, at midnight. Like I don't get a lot of sleep. They're not nice, calming, quiet, peaceful camping trips. Not that there's anything wrong with that. I enjoy those too, but I enjoy more, especially when I'm filming, I enjoy more doing stuff that's more fun for me and that stuff is not uh, not especially fun for my wife and so that's the main reason how does your wife feel about your absence at home i mean it's my job and she understands that it's my job and that i need to go out and and do these things and you know it's just it's just like they're they're business trips basically is, is one way of, of looking at it when i was a kid my dad traveled a ton he was gone you know for months at a time doing work and you know, would my mom have preferred that my dad was home more? Yeah, probably. Would Cassie, my wife, prefer that I'm home more? Yeah, probably, and I would like that too, you know. I wouldn't say no to spending more time at home, but 
it's my job and I'm, I'm home more than I'm away and you know, we make it work. Is she tired of you not being home? No, <laughs> I don't think so. Like, again, I'm, I'm home much more than I'm away. I do travel a lot, but it's not like half the time. It's not even a quarter of the time. I'm, I'm traveling probably 70, maybe 80 days a year if it's a busy year. Uh, the next person said, I believe Cassie finished her teaching degree. Is she teaching now? She's not. Basically, uh, she got burned out and she, she graduated last year and that was great, but she's relaxing these days, sort of. Uh, another several people asked what she does with her time if she's, if she's not working and she does a lot of stuff. So the main thing is that she's, she's volunteering with our church. She's basically in charge of of teaching the teenage girls. And that takes a lot of her time uh, on Sundays, but then also throughout the week, they have activities and she's planning and, and talking to people and, and helping people. And so uh, that's the main thing that she does. She also does a lot of house work, like, you know, improvements to the house, cleaning, cooking. She does all that stuff. She is considering going back to work. And if she wants to go back to work, then that's great. I'll support her doing that. But if she wants to, to not do that and she wants to focus on other things, then that's, that's fine too. Several people said that they would like to see us traveling together more often. And yes, I would too. That is something that we are gonna be doing this year. Again, she can't come with me on, my, on most of my trips because they're just too, they're too hard. <laughs> and she doesn't, she doesn't want to come on most of my trips, but I do have some, uh, just us trips planned and you guys will come along for part of that. We are going to go probably to the Black Hills of South Dakota in June for our anniversary. While we're there, we might go a little bit further and go to Chicago where my, uh, where my sister lives, go spend some time there. We also might do a Pacific Northwest loop uh, trip sometime later on in the year. But yeah, I don't, don't quite know the details yet, but you will see her more this year in the videos than probably any other year in the channel's history. So if you like Cassie, if you're a fan of my wife, that's, that's a good thing. I'm curious to know what your wife's ethnicity is. She's so beautiful. Yes, she is. Thank you for saying so. She is half Filipino. And then the other half is like, I think mostly French and English. Uh, but her, her dad was in the Marines, in the US Marines, and he was, I think he was stationed in the Philippines. And he met his wife, he met Cassie's mom over there, and they've been married for uh, 30 whatever years, been married ever since. And then I actually have a question from Cassie. She said, what is the number one place you want your wife to see that she hasn't seen yet? And I would say more of Wyoming. Uh, she, she hasn't seen a ton of Wyoming. I mean, she's been to Yellowstone, she's been to the Tetons, she's been to Laramie and, and she's been to various places in Wyoming, but she hasn't been to most of the mountain ranges. She hasn't been to, to Cheyenne, she hasn't been to Casper, she hasn't been to, uh, Devil's Tower, like there are a lot of places that I, I'd like to take her. Uh, the number one place is probably the Wind River Range though. Again, we keep coming back to that in this video. It's the mountain range that you can't see from here, but you can see it from certain places in town. Uh, it's, again, one of my favorite places, probably my number one favorite place in the country. She's never been there. I would like her to visit. And so we're gonna do that this year for sure. We're almost there guys, almost to the end of this hike, almost to the end of the video. Bear with me. Let me show you the view from the top of this little sandstone knoll. So over here, we can see most of the hike that I've done. I am parked right there in the middle. This is Rock Springs right here. This road, if you keep following this road, you'll get to Colorado in about an hour. And this is the, the terrain. I love this part. There's this little like rocky ridge, this little backbone that's super fun to hike along. And then uh, I hiked up this, this canyon here, and then hung a right up to here, and here we are. Let's wrap this up, guys. We have one more category, and that is questions about me, some more personal stuff that you've been wondering about. My voice is going out. <clears throat> I've been sick for the last couple of weeks. I'm getting over a sickness, so even at the start of this video, my voice was a little bit kind of gravelly, but after talking for the last I don't know how long I've been doing this, but uh, it's, it's, it's getting worse. So we're gonna make this quick. What is your favorite fish to catch and why? Probably cutthroat trout, because they're native to this part of the country and I like catching native fish. There are various subspecies of cutthroat, but in general, I like catching cutthroat trout. How has your hip surgery affected your hiking? 
So several years ago, I had two hip surgeries, one in each hip. I had a torn labrum in each hip. It's like the, the O-ring of cartilage that goes around your hip joint. And uh, so far, so good. I don't think I'm, like I'll never be back to like 100%, but uh, I mean, I can obviously do all the things that I've been doing. Sometimes they ache a little bit more than others, but overall the surgeries were successful and I'm feeling, feeling pretty good. Raymond L. Copeland said, Hi Tristan, you are very articulate and well-read. Can you tell us where you were educated and what was your major? So I went to BYU, Brigham Young University in Provo, Utah, and I graduated with a degree in linguistics. So I'm a linguist by training. My minor was editing, as in like editing a book, like getting rid of the, the grammar mistakes and punctuation and, and making that all, all work right. And then the next question is, I'm curious about your educational and professional background and how it prepared you for this adventure you're on, if only to say it made you realize what you did not want to do. So yeah, I studied linguistics. Um, I never, I don't know if I ever really wanted to be, ling be a linguist, like professionally. I enjoyed it. I thought it was very interesting. Uh, I wanted to be self-employed in some regard. I wanted to, to have my own business and have control, have more control over my time and, and have control over where I could choose to live. And so after graduating college, I was making enough money to, I was making like a thousand or $1,500 a month online uh, with various websites and, and eBooks and things like that. And so that was enough money to spend about two and a half years traveling the world, living in cheap places. So again, that's when I lived in Mexico for seven months. I was in, I think I was in Thailand for seven months. I was in Eastern Europe for several months and the rest of Southeast Asia for several months. Cassie and I actually met on that trip. We met at church in Cambodia, believe it or not. And that's, a, that's another story for another time. So during that time, I was working online and still making, you know, not a ton of money, but enough to, to live. And I was writing nonfiction travel and adventure books. Like I, I wrote books about, about my, my treks in Nepal, about the Annapurna circuit and uh, Everest Base Camp and other things like that. And you can still buy those on Amazon if you, if you look for them. And so before I was a YouTuber, I was an author basically writing those books. And I had some other websites that brought in some like affiliate income and that sort of thing. And that's, that's how I ended up writing the SUV RVing book. And as I talked about earlier, that eventually led to the creation of this channel. The camera is overheating because I've been recording for so long. I have to start and stop the recording pretty often. So <laughs> hopefully again, we can get through this. Have you studied any of the indigenous languages of the Southwest? It's interesting to see place names in, the, in these languages along your travels. Uh, I have not. Again, I am a linguist, but I have not studied any of the languages in this part of the country. Uh, interestingly, the languages in this area, the Native American languages, are part of the Udo Aztecan language family. And that stretches from here, from like Wyoming, where I think the native languages are like Shoshone, and then we get into, into Paiute languages, uh, all the way down to Mexico. So the, the languages that, or the, the language that the Aztecs spoke when Cortez came and, and conquered the, the Mexica, the, the Aztecs that lived in the Valley of Mexico, this is all, it's all the same language group. From here, from Wyoming to the Valley of Mexico in central Mexico is all the Udo Aztecan language group. Within that group, there are lots and lots of languages. They're not, I mean, there's no like one language that I can study for the Western US that would give me an insight into the place names, right? Like there were lots of, lots of languages here. To really learn a language, you have to have a lot of input. You need to read, listen, watch a lot of stuff. I don't have the time or, or inclination to learn any of the Native American languages. They're not, frankly, they're not useful for me. Uh, I'd much rather learn Spanish and then go on adventures in, in Mexico and beyond. I would like to know about the status of your house. You previously mentioned plans for improvements. <sighs> they are ongoing. We've done a lot. We tore out the walls. We, we put new insulation in the walls. We raised the ceiling in the living room, in the bedroom, in the hallway. We've done, uh, I mean, I've done a ton in the back house. So we have two houses. There's a front house and a back house. The back house is mostly my office and my studio and my work area. In the back there, I took out the the paneling, I took off the wood paneling, I patched all the holes in the walls, I painted everything, uh, removed the popcorn ceiling from the ceiling in there. In the front house, again, that's where we removed the walls and put new walls in, uh, put new wiring in the walls. Uh, we've done a ton, uh, we've done a lot. 
It doesn't seem like a lot because we've had the house for about a year and a half now. And so I feel like we, we should have done more by now, but we, uh, the, the new floors were just delivered yesterday. We've been putting up trim around the windows. We ordered a new couch because now that we have the floors, we can, we can put it, we can put furniture in the living room. And so there's still a lot to do in the next like month or two, a lot is going to get done in the, in the living room of the front house. At some point I'll probably do a video showing you guys everything, all the changes that we've done. In the meantime, I've made several adventure know-how bonus videos showing the different stages that we've been at. So if you are super interested in the house renovation projects, go watch the house update videos over there. David Brown said, do you feel like you're living the life of your dreams or are there times when you think you want to try something different? Um, I love my life. I, I have an awesome life. I have an awesome job. I love my wife. I love my dog. I love our houses. I love Rock Springs. I love, uh, I love everything. I'm very happy with my life right now. This is the life of my dreams. I mean, ideally I'd, you know, get a windfall of several million dollars and, and, uh, you know, we could <laughs> move along with the house improvements a little bit faster and, and, uh, I could maybe not have to travel quite as much, but overall, yeah, I mean, this is awesome. I'm super happy with my life. Uh, someone else asked if traveling ever gets old. Not really. I still love it. Sometimes having to travel, it's like, you know, if, if I, if I'm out of videos, out of videos to publish and I need to get new content and I have to go like this week, sometimes that gets a little bit old, but you know, sometimes I'm better than at other times with having enough of a buffer, having enough videos from a trip to where, you know, I can, I can have a nice long rest period at home before I get off, uh, go off onto the next trip. I did get several questions about kids. Are we planning on having kids? When are we going to have kids? Uh, yes, we would like to have kids. And we are, uh, we really wanted to hold off until Cassie was done with college because it would be very hard for her to do both at the same time. And she is done. She, again, she graduated a year ago. And so we are open to having kids whenever, whenever they happen. What kind of music do you like? I don't really listen to music. I, I'm much more of a podcast and audiobook guy, but I do listen to Spotify. I have a Spotify account, Spotify membership. And uh, I think Spotify says, I mean, basically I just listen to whatever the Spotify algorithm gives me. At the end of every year, Spotify does a, a yearly wrap up of your music listening tastes and they defined indie poptimism as the genre that I listen to most. Don't really know what that means, but that's, that's what it is. There you have it. What makes you happy in your life? Does traveling get boring after a while? No, I still, I still love to travel. I still love making these videos. Uh, being with my wife makes me happy. Being at home, uh, being out here, being in places where I travel to, you know, hiking and all the adventuring I do makes me happy. Um, I really like figuring out things that, that should exist, but don't, and then making those things as far as my work goes. And so things like this channel, my fishing channel, the various businesses I've had in the past, you know, I, I like, I like seeing a need and filling that need. That is very satisfying to me. And I think it's something that I'm good at. There's one little step here that I have to climb down to get back to the level ground. Okay, just a couple more questions. Uh, Ephraim Robles said, where do you find your inspiration to go on solo hikes? So I actually ran into Ephraim uh, in the Fisher Towers near Moab about a month ago. I was hiking there with Cassie and Bowser and he, he recognized me and we had a nice chat. Uh, as far as inspiration for solo hikes go, I don't know if you mean like, like my motivation for the hikes. In that regard, I just like hiking. I like being out alone. I like my adventuring. Uh, but as far as inspiration, like the knowledge goes, guidebooks. Guidebooks are super helpful in finding, finding uh, all kinds of good hikes to do. And then finally, we have one more question, guys. Thanks for sticking with me throughout this, if you made it this far. What is your at-home exercise regime to stay in hiking and climbing shape? I don't have one. I go hiking when I want to. I come out and do stuff like this when I feel like it. When I'm tired of being at my desk, tired of editing videos, I'll come out here and go, go for a hike. There's a mountain just across the road here uh, that makes a great little local hike. The mountain that you could see over there more that has snow on it. I mean, you can hike all over that. So lots to do around here to keep you busy. And... <sighs> I'll tell you what, editing this video is gonna keep me busy. I have no idea how long this is gonna be. It's gonna be like 
an hour, two hours. I've been out here forever, it feels like. But, you know, again, I haven't done this in six, five or six years. I probably won't do it again for another five or six years. So I hope you guys got your question in. Hope you enjoyed the video. If you do have another question, leave it down below. I'll try to respond to it in the comments on this video in particular. I'll try to answer any, any other questions that, uh, that I didn't get to that you guys have. Thank you for sticking with me again in this video, but also throughout the, the years I've been doing this. 500 and something videos, 200,000 subscribers. It's been a wild ride. Uh, recording these videos has literally changed my life. We were able to buy two houses. Uh, I'm able to provide for my family. I'm able to basically live the life of my dreams. Like, it's been awesome and it's all thanks to you guys. I cannot thank you enough for watching and uh, again, I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope you've enjoyed all the videos up till now. Stay tuned, we have lots of good stuff yet to come. Lots of fun adventures this year and beyond. So, I'll see you in the next one. Be sure to check out Adventure Know How, my new site, where you can gain access to a map of all of my free campsites, plus monthly bonus videos that you won't find anywhere else. Learn more at adventureknowhow.com. And for links to everything else SUV RVing related, visit suvrving.com. Links to these sites and more will be in the video description.